Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you now see my screen. And I'm also going to put in the chat a link, and that'll just take you to a Word document that I'm just using basically as a cheap website where you can find a download of the slides that I'm getting ready to present. And then also uh, some of the supplemental resources that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I am first excited to join you all um, and talk about this topic that I'm really interested and passionate about from uh, your neighbor to the West, uh, your neighbor to the West that doesn't have nearly the forest you do, uh, but we certainly have similar ecology in our forests. And then also uh, I grew, was born and raised in Indiana uh, did a degree at Purdue University that had pretty heavy forestry overtones and then did another degree at Ohio State University. So I've worked all around Illinois, albeit not ever in Illinois. So I'm going to do my best to try to represent uh, the challenges and opportunities for wildlife conservation in Illinois forests, uh, hopefully get you thinking uh, creatively about what you could do in land that you own or have influence over, uh, and then hopefully leave lots of time for questions at the end as we go through stuff. Uh, and then Anything that I don't cover, I trust that all these supplemental resources that I put in that document uh, will answer your questions because there's a lot of really great stuff out there from your uh, neighbors on each side. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started with that. Here's my as presentation outline, what I'd like to do today. I'm going to just kind of go through this in three chunks. Uh, the first chunk, we're going to just define what wildlife is and what they need, because I think when people say wildlife, many people are picturing different things. And so I like to lay my thinking out for you to uh, know kind of where we're headed. Uh, then we're going to talk about the basics of wildlife management, what wildlife biologists do and how we think and how you can apply that to land that you own or have influence over. And then finally, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about wildlife habitat management uh, and some specific practices. Uh, fortunately, building on and uh, often at times, I think reiterating points that Hank just nicely uh, laid out for us. So you'll start to see some commonalities in the way we talk about these opportunities and challenges. Um, I'm going to talk here in a second about wildlife, but it would help me to kind of know what you all are interested in. Uh, if we were out in the forest right now, I'd make everybody raise their hand that was interested in wildlife habitat in some way or wildlife outcomes. But since we're on Zoom, what I'd like you to do is type in the chat species of wildlife that you've been thinking about maybe having an impact on, on your land. And then I'm going to present a little bit about this, and then I'm going to pause and take a look at that chat so I kind of get a feel for what folks are interested in. And I don't want to make any assumptions about uh, what you may or may not be interested in. So I'll take a pause, uh, assess what you tell me, and then I'll try to think about that as I present the rest. So when I think about wildlife in the forest, I think about them in a couple of different ways. Forested ecosystems are unique in that uh, they're, I work a lot in grasslands and wetlands and grasslands or wetlands are kind of just two dimensional places, but forests are really three dimensional. And so when I think about where wildlife occur in the forest, I like to think about it in these three dimensions. And so uh, from the top to the bottom, we can imagine species like the Northern Perula, which is a canopy nesting neotropical migrant warbler that is uh, in our forest during the summertime and then takes off to the forests of South and Central America during the wintertime. They build their nests way up in the canopy of the trees and we rarely see them, but we can with a trained ear uh, learn to hear them. Uh, red bats are really cool migratory species of bats that actually uh, spend their days out in the foliage of vegetation, which I always just think is pretty cool. Most bats we tend to think of being up by the trunk uh, or uh, up underneath loose bark or something. But red bats are these foliage specialists. They'll even be in foliage on the ground. But here I depicted them way up in the top uh, out at the tips of the branches. Southern flying squirrels are like the coolest thing ever if you get a chance to see them. And they are kind of more ubiquitous than you would think. They just happen to be nocturnal. That's why their eyes are so big. But they like to hang up high in the canopy, of course, because then they glide down uh, to other places to sort of spend their days. Gray tree frogs are one of many amphibians we find in the forest, but these are the ones kind of the most arboreal, the ones that live highest up in the trees and are, uh, again, one that we can tune our ears to pick up on. Gray rat snakes. Snakes might not be your thing, but they're some people's things. And uh, we have a rather arboreal, meaning living in trees, uh, snake, the gray rat snake, and lots of snakes that are found in the forest at lower uh, levels as well. The gray fox, I probably have him a little high. Uh, in the tree, but you'll see I was running out of space on my slide. But hey, great 
great foxes sometimes climb trees and i think that's pretty awesome uh and they're definitely a forest uh, dwelling species that we're concerned about long-term population declines in wild turkeys i put them right in the middle because they split their time between spending their days on the ground and building their nests and raising their young on the ground and then of course roosting up in mature trees during the day uh, tiger swallowtails, I put them in there to remind us that lots of invertebrates rely on our forested ecosystems and, of course, structure the ecology of our forested ecosystems. Tiger swallowtails are, I don't know, perhaps the prettiest of the woodland butterflies, though I know that's certainly uh, subjective, but they're one of dozens of species of woodland butterflies, and as Hank indicated, hundreds of species actually thousands of species of butterflies and moths that are dependent on woody plants. Tiger swallowtails, their larvae specialize on uh, members of the rose family, and that's where they uh, their larvae live. And then their adults, the adults emerge and, of course, feed on flowering plants, mostly in the understory and edges of our forests. White-tailed deer are found right on the ground. And smallmouth salamanders are one of many uh, amphibians that are found in the uh, understory, uh, underneath the leaf litter in many cases, and then also spending their winter underneath uh, the ground itself. So our forests in three dimensions, they go from the very top of the canopy with the northern perula to literally under the ground with smallmouth salamanders and other species of amphibians and reptiles. The other thing is now, this is a graphic a little bit harder to wrap your head around, but think about it now in two dimensions, like you're looking down on the forest and we find wildlife distributed across this gradient as well. We have edge species, species that thrive sort of on the transition between forests and other things, agriculture, pasture, grasslands, wetlands, whatever. Uh, Eastern towhee is a beautiful bird uh, that says their name during the breeding season and I uh, thought they would exemplify these edge species. They kind of like shrubby transitional areas on the edges of our forest. There's other species of wildlife that live just inside the forest. We call them forest interior species. And wood thrushes are a good example of that. They build their nests in interior forested areas. And then often related to interior species, but another important concept is area sensitive species, species that will only occur in large patches of forest. Uh, pileated woodpeckers are like our classic Midwestern area sensitive species. You're not going to have a pileated woodpecker in your shelter belt on a farm. They like big continuous tracts of timber, and we'll talk about why that becomes important. And then, okay, one more dimension to throw at you, a temporal dimension. Think about forests through time. And we know, of course, that forests change through time with things like disturbances, uh, harvest, grazing, fire, development, land retirement, et cetera. Um, and what changes through that time generally tends to be the amount of sunlight that hits the, the floor. And so I've got that depicted with this gradient. From left to right, canopy cover is increasing and because disturbance frequency is decreasing from left to right. On the left, you'd have like an oak savanna, just a single tree in a grassland environment that burns really frequently. And on the right, you'd have a closed canopy, mature forest like a maple basswood forest uh, that just doesn't really see any any sort of disturbance and has a closed canopy. Uh, well, wildlife, of course, respond to this gradient as well. And so these lines might not be exactly perfect, and we could certainly debate it, but I tried to demonstrate the diversity of wildlife that may exist across this gradient. And to make sense out of wildlife management in a forest, we have to parse all this information, three-dimensional distribution within the forest, two-dimensional distribution across space, Variation across space and time and forests and ecosystems are always changing because they're always growing uh, and new disturbances are coming online or, or uh, being retired. And so we, in effective wildlife management, we have to understand all this complexity and we ultimately have to know what our goals are and what we're trying to manage for. So now I'm going to take a very brief pause and read, you're going to have to watch me read, what you all are interested in. I see fungi, that'll really push me. I am definitely a vertebrate and dabble in the invertebrates. Deer, turkey, and ducks, I can do that. Birds, I like that for sure. Frogs and toads, I'll do my best. Uh, bats and bobcats, I know more about bats than bobcats, but I can definitely speak to those things. Uh, I love birds too. That's You're gonna see that bias throughout the talk. Owls, woodpeckers, box turtles, and river otters. Uh, Lepidoptera, 
Here are mosquitoes. We're going to talk about reducing wildlife abundance. Prairie chickens, that'll be outside of our scope, but I can certainly talk about bob whites. That's a bird I studied for my master's. And dung beetles, I won't be able to speak much to that, but I love the diversity that you all shared. So thanks for sharing the diversity. I'm going to try to park that in my mind and try to deliver on that, and then trust you'll ask me questions uh, as we go. Okay, to understand any species, whether it's a dung beetle or a bobcat and everything in between, you have to understand their habitat needs. And when we say habitat, a lot of times people picture a single ecosystem. You may say wildlife habitat, and you may just automatically have thought of a forest. But if I say wildlife habitat, and I'm thinking about wildlife habitat for a monarch butterfly, I'm not going to picture a forest generally, maybe the edges of a forest, but I'm not going to picture a forest. I'm going to picture a prairie with milkweeds and nectar resources. And But if I say wildlife habitat and I'm thinking of a fox squirrel, then I may picture a forested environment. But if I'm thinking of a southern flying squirrel, maybe a little bit different than it would be for a fox squirrel and, and every species, of course. So this is one of the challenges. And so wildlife ecologists we always talk about this slide right here, that wildlife habitat is three elements and considerations for how those three elements are arranged. The three elements, of course, are the three things we all need to survive, food, water, and shelter, and then some consideration for their arrangement in space, because you can't have all the food in North Carolina and all the shelter in Pennsylvania and all the water in Georgia. We'd never uh, be able to survive. So we have to consider their uh, availability and spatial arrangement. So I'm going to break down each one of these very roughly, but then as I go through my talk and talk about management uh, practices the rest of uh, the presentation today, I'm going to hopefully be coming back to these things and reminding you that certain silvicultural practices may help us with food or may help us with space or may help us uh, with shelter. And so what? where do we find food in the forest? Well, lots of places, you know, everything eats everything else. And so uh, everything is food. Um, but uh, what I tend to think about is hard and soft mass. You're going to hear me say that a lot more. So that's fleshy fruit is soft mass. Hard mass would be hard fruits like uh, acorns, walnuts, hickories, American hazel, and the like. Um, also, plants generally, um, and also flowers of plants. So many organisms eat broadleaf plants especially, and then many organisms also rely on flowers themselves, uh, namely pollinating uh, insects. So we want to think about nectar resources as a food. And then wildlife are food for wildlife. Um, depending on your definition of wildlife, if you, like me, include uh, invertebrates in your definition of wildlife, then they are really important food resources that uh, Hank already introduced. And we're going to reiterate, I'm going to reiterate that a few more times with a few slides. And I've got that picture here with a um, uh, moth larvae. I think that's a moth. I can't remember. I I didn't write down what that was, um, but a moth or a butterfly larvae here. Uh, and then, of course, um, raptors eat lots of snakes and snakes eat lots of bird eggs and um, amphibians eat lots of insects and other things. And so animals as food. And so we want to think about those kind of things as we think about wildlife habitat. Uh, when we think about shelter for wildlife habitat, it could be different things, of course, to different organisms, but big ones that we tend to think about. Down wood can be really important uh, component of shelter for reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, and lots of different insect species. And so we think about the things that are lying on the forest floor, the leaf litter as a component of wildlife habitat. Uh, places to roost, that may be like a large tree with uh, strong horizontal branches for a wild turkey to spend the night, or it might be a loose bark tree like this white oak pictured here that would be good for uh, bats to crawl up under uh, during the daytime to escape the elements. Uh, also, places for organisms to raise their young, and I tend to think about birds a lot, and so birds, of course, nest all throughout the three dimensions of the forest, but uh, places for each one of those species to successfully hide and, and uh, pull off their nests are an important part of shelter. Uh, also, foresters we, and wildlife managers and forested ecosystems tend to think a lot about cavities. Uh, woodpeckers, of course, create cavities. Also, natural processes like uh, breaking off of branches create cavities as well. Uh, and lots of organisms use them. So woodpeckers primarily create them, but then uh, either um, 
voluntarily or not, woodpeckers uh, leave a hole and tree frogs will use them, flying squirrels will use them, snakes will use them, insects will use them, uh, and tons of other different species of birds that can't themselves excavate holes. So cavities can be a really important component of shelter in a forest. And then dense cover. What I have here is a uh, harvested area in a forest that provides really dense cover uh, for uh, maybe fawning cover for um, deer or a nesting cover for wild turkeys. That can be a really important component of shelter. Water is another, of course, important component of wildlife habitat for drinking for some species can be limiting and where they occur. And then, of course, for reproduction is really important, like for uh, some species of reptiles and all of our amphibian species. Uh, we can find water in forested environments from wetland ecosystems, and we'll talk a little bit more about protecting those. And then, of course, rivers and streams where our forests often tend to occur in our really modified Midwestern landscapes. And then finally, the space component. I already mentioned this with area sensitivity, but uh, we want to think about the neighbors, essentially. When we think about wildlife habitat, uh, we want to think about uh, some species may have patch size limitations, or some species may not be able to move through non-forested landscapes. And so connectivity of our forests really matters. And so that means when you think about managing your land or land that you have influence over for wildlife, you may need to be thinking about uh, what the neighbors are doing and how your forest uh, exists in sort of a matrix of other forested ecosystems. Okay, so now that we kind of have our head wrapped around uh, what we want to talk about in terms of what wildlife are and what wildlife need, I want to talk about the basics of wildlife management. And what I have depicted here is sort of two pillars. I don't know if this graphic perfectly captures this, but sort of two pillars of wildlife management that we have to, to deal with. And we often pull the same levers of wildlife habitat management to impact each side of this uh, gradient. We may often want to increase abundance, have more bats, have more bobcats, have more dung beetles or something uh, on our forested land because we derive pleasure from that or we enjoy hunting or bird watching or something like that. There are also many occasions in forest management where we want to decrease wildlife for some reason. Uh, the one that primarily comes to mind and that I'll talk about are just challenges with forest regeneration posed by browsing animals, namely deer. Uh, and uh, But there may be other scenarios where you want to have less predation pressure, for example, or less cowbird parasitism in your forest. Um, then you'll think about manipulating the habitat in a way to decrease conflicts. And all of this hinges on careful observations. And that's something that we wildlife biologists really like to preach. We want to encourage you to make careful observations in your forest so you sort of understand what levers you should be pulling. So careful observations could include things like documenting the phenology of uh, plants in your forest to see who's blooming when and whether or not nectar resources or food resource, other food resources are available throughout the year. Uh, critically examining sign and behavior, where you're seeing animals or where you're not. Examining your biases and means of observations. I always remind people that the reason you see deer, for example, uh, in an open field is because you can't see them when they're feeding in the forest under the canopy of the trees. And so scrutinize how you're making observations on your land and how those are influencing your management decisions. And then finally, tinker around. That's one of the many privileges of this stuff. It's often as much art as science. And so you want to tinker around, make careful observations after you manipulate things and see how the wildlife respond, and then start to adjust uh, your strategies and try again, essentially. So lots of wildlife management hinges on these careful observations. If you want to increase abundance of animals, which if you make careful observations and understand that you're not meeting your goals, you want to set realistic goals for species and life phases, uh, breeding wild turkeys, for example, or wintering northern bobwhites, uh, things that you can achieve. And then you want to set out understanding what limiting factors, uh, what factors are limiting uh, your achievement of those goals. Do northern bobwhites have enough food for the winter? Do they have enough sh shelter for the winter? Are they arranged in a way that is uh, promoting their survival and persistence or not? 
then we start to manipulate habitat. And that's what the rest of my talk is going to be about, is how we pull these levers of wildlife habitat uh, to achieve these uh, management objectives. And then, of course, just to reiterate, you make careful observations and document your impacts and revise your approach. And so I'm going to leave it at that for increasing abundance because well, I'm going to come back to this and really talk a lot more about that as we talk about habitat management. And so the last thing that I want to mention in the basics or the mechanics of wildlife management is this notion of how do we decrease conflicts. And so here is a decision tree that I once made as a joke and then realized that it was actually pretty useful. And so I've started using it in presentations. So uh, here's how a wildlife biologist thinks about messaging on various wildlife conflicts. You start first with an assessment. How annoying is any given wildlife species? The deer that are feeding in your tree planting, um, the raccoons that are getting into your barn, or um, the brown-headed cowbirds that are parasitizing the nests on the edge of your forest. The first question is, can you just essentially tolerate it? And uh, a lot of wildlife management is about preaching tolerance. And so if you can tolerate it, it's not too annoying, then cope with it and you don't have to decrease that conflict. But if it is problematic, then you start to think through this hierarchy that wildlife biologists use about how to reduce those conflicts in your environment. So first principle of effective wildlife conflict resolution is to remember that it's so much easier to change human behavior than it is to change wildlife behavior. We're much more rational than the wildlife. And frankly, the wildlife always have nothing, nothing to do uh, except figure out ways around your various uh, exposures or, or uh, uh, prevention methods. So if you can exclude it, if you can change human behavior, that's gonna be the easiest way. And I think a tree shelter like this is an, a, a good example of a way to try to minimize uh, potential conflicts with wildlife in, for example, a tree planting or someplace where you're trying to regenerate uh, trees where you may have a lot of browse pressure. So first, try to exclude the wildlife. If you can't exclude the wildlife, like with a cage or a tree shelter, then maybe you can change the environment, make it less attractive for a deer to come into the tree planting, provide an alternative food source on the property that would attract the deer and pull them away from your uh, direct seeding or something like that. Uh, you could also uh, use the tops of a harvest to protect or shelter uh, regenerating trees, change the environment in a way that makes it less accessible. Then sometimes uh, managing wildlife populations is an important management tool. Uh, so we ask a question, can you legally and humanely kill it. And that's rather blunt, but can you manage deer populations on your property? If you have a lot of deer pressure, for example, on your tree planting, then you may want to think about within the confines of the law, uh, reducing deer densities on your property or working with your neighbors to reduce deer density on your properties, for example, through the harvest of does. And then finally, sometimes we just have to live with it. Even if we didn't think we could tolerate it, sometimes we just don't have enough tools in the tool belt and we have to sort of reevaluate and shift our expectations for the property uh, to confront the reality of some of the conflicts that we may experience. Okay, now I want to spend the last 20 minutes or so talking about managing wildlife habitat. And now managing wildlife habitat can be used for both of those outcomes of wildlife management, increasing abundance or decreasing abundance. But in my presentation here, I'm going to talk primarily about and think primarily about trying to increase abundance of various species of wildlife. So first, I just wanted to share with you a picture of a beautiful, healthy forest ecosystem from here in Iowa, uh, something that I kind of think maybe exemplifies um, an ideal. Uh, as you're going to see as I start to talk about uh, healthy forest ecosystems, uh, a diversity of plants in the understory, uh, mature canopy trees that uh, produce a lot of food. Uh, they're primarily oaks and hickories in this case uh, for wildlife in regeneration in the midstory. Uh, the big takeaway from my presentation is that healthy forests help wildlife. And so I've started with a picture of a healthy forest ecosystem and anything that you do to create healthy forest ecosystems on land that you own or have influence over is going to do right by wildlife, broadly defined. And that kind of gives me 
a middle of the ground uh, scenario to think about. If you wanted to just have Bob Whites, then it'd probably be a different presentation that I'm go going to give. If you wanted to just have cerulean warblers it's going to be a different presentation that i'm getting ready to give i'm going to shoot for kind of right in the middle healthy forest ecosystems and how we can achieve those to manage uh, for the best wildlife habitat and to do that we're going to do three things we're going to combat invasive species we're going to manage succession with sunlight and we're going to protect and enhance the unique places on our property that may have a disproportionate impact on wildlife outcomes there so first, combating invasive species. Uh, first, what do we mean? Hank just set this up really nicely for us, but lots of different species, uh, lots of different invasive species to choose from. Uh, I can't talk about them all, but I can talk about those that I hate the most. And the one that I hate more than all of the others is this one, bush honeysuckle. Uh, scientific name, Lanicera macchiae. You'll often hear this also called Amir honeysuckle. There's also in this... Uh, my uh, hatred is also directed towards Tartarian honeysuckle and other species of exotic shrub forming honeysuckles from Southeastern Asia. You can see among the challenges with this is this is a picture that I took on my family's farm in Indiana, where there is absolutely nothing under the canopy of this honeysuckle and no other native species of wild of plants in the Midwest grow like this. And it's completely altered the forest ecosystem. Another one that's on my most wanted list is Japanese barberry, um, shown here in the wintertime in a state forest here in Iowa. This can be really aggressive uh, in certain places. Oriental bittersweet can be really problematic, including having negative impacts on canopy trees by uh, suppressing their growth. Um, burning bush is another one that can be really problematic in certain places where it has seed source coming out of uh, forest and envir or urban environments often, uh, and it's also on my most wanted list. Uh, that's just a couple of examples. There's tons more, and you uh, could meet with a, a local forestry professional, and they would really know uh, the, the greatest challenges to in invasive species in your backyard. Um, what I want to mention now is the sort of two ways in which invasive species are really problematic for wildlife. And the first one of these ways that invasive species are problematic for wildlife is that they have this capacity to change the structure of the forest. And so this is a picture from southern, southeastern Iowa near Illinois, uh, where you can see all of the green in the understory is bush honeysuckle or amir honeysuckle. And then you can see all of the overstory trees have mostly lost their leaves and honeysuckle is still growing. It's one of the many ways that honeysuckle has competitive advantages over native plants. So what I wanna point out to you is that uh, this has completely altered the forest structure in that it has replaced everything that would have been growing in the understory. Uh, and it's also growing in a way that most native plants found in the Midwest don't grow, really dense and really cluttering of that under and mid-story area of our forest. And so let's sort of transition here and look at what we what I mean when I say under and mid-story. And Hank showed some slides uh, that showed this as well. You'll, you'll hear sort of different uh, distance cutoffs, but I'm using 10 feet here as the cutoff between understory and midstory. Uh, and this is a really vital area of our forests for a lot of species of wildlife, including bats. And we're really worried about bat conservation in the Midwest because of the uh, one invasion of our forests and erosion of their uh, health uh, from exotic invasive species, and two, because of the introduction of exotic fungal pathogen that causes a disease cause, called white nose syndrome. Uh, bats forage in open understory and forest edges using echolocation. And imagine if you're using echolocation, all you would want to do is have your signal go out and bounce off of potential prey and come back to your receptor uh, and help you find prey sources. But in forests that are invaded by exotic honeysuckle and buckthorn in the northern part of Illinois and Iowa, uh, that causes a bunch of what bat ecologists call clutter. Lots of additional plants and 
uh, biomass that the bat's echolocation is bouncing off of, and it's giving an unreliable signal back to the bats, and they can't find their forage. And so we find that bats avoid these areas with high densities of, of uh, plants in the understory and midstory, and that's exactly where these problematic invasive species thrive. We also know from research across the Midwest that birds don't really like to place their nests in or underneath honeysuckle. So the uh, honeysuckle and buckthorn take away opportunities for nesting locations in a forest. Uh, and they really just sort of alter the way wildlife use forested environments. And so removing exotic species of uh, exotic species in the understory and midstory can be a really good way to enhance your forests for wildlife habitat. The other thing that they do, that exotic species do, is they alter the ecology of forested ecosystems. And so what I'm showing here is a study that was done out in the east. It was actually done in urban areas, but its lessons certainly apply to our uh, forested environments as well. And what's on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the percent non-native plants in somebody's yard. And what's on the Y or the vertical axis is the number of young fledged by Carolina chickadees, which we have a few of in the Midwest, but they're just like black cap chickadees uh, and the same logic would apply. And what you see is that chickadees really fail to be, to raise their young in areas that are completely dominated by non-native plants. And that of course is not because chickadees are feeding their young non uh, plants, for example, what they are doing is feeding their young the insects that grow on plants found in a forest or a yard. And as the percent of non-native plants increases, the abundance of insects also increase, decreases, and it causes these reproductive failures in chickadees. And so these researchers have suggested that basically all of the insects that birds need to raise their young come from just a few genera types essentially of native plants that if they're present in a yard or in a forest birds do well and if they're absent in a yard or forest then birds really struggle to survive so here's what the researchers have rec have found for number of Lepidoptera, that's butterflies and moths, hosted by different taxa of plants found, in this case, in central Illinois. And what you see here is there's a couple of species that are really carrying the weight. And Hank already mentioned this. Oaks are our number one species for hosting butterfly and moth larvae, which, of, for, of course, are caterpillars that are then used by birds to raise their young. So oaks are number one. Cherries and plums are number two and willows are number three in terms of the diversity of butterfly and moth larvae that they host. So if you have those species in your forest, then birds will do well. If you don't, then birds will really struggle. And what we find is that invasive species are inhibiting our ability to have these uh, species of native trees and shrubs that host the greatest diversity of butterflies and moths and thus altering the forest structure. So, Control invasive species. How do you do it? We've got resources at the end, lots of resources from uh, local conservation professionals about how to do it, what the best chemical treatments are. You can cut and treat. Uh, you can use prescribed fire in some contexts for some species. We've already talked about goat grazing, and that's sort of a new frontier and a really exciting way to control invasive species. And importantly, get help from professional foresters and also cost share uh, from programs like the Environmental Qualities Incentive, Quality Incentives Program uh, from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Okay, next, manage succession with sunlight. So I'm back to this slide. I showed you uh, this gradient from most canopy cover on the right, least canopy cover on the left, and most disturbance on the left and least disturbance on the right, that means that is also driving wildlife responses. And what I want to draw your attention to is the middle of this figure. Notice that we start to see a whole bunch of species sort of piling up with a preference for intermediate levels of canopy and intermediate levels of disturbance. 
This is kind of what we call our oak woodlands, which is kind of the ideal here in the Midwest of these uh, forested ecosystems that have a little bit of vegetation in the understory, uh, kind of an open canopy, lots of oaks and hickories, uh, and a bunch of diversity of both plants and wildlife. Uh, what ecologists call that is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. You learned it in kindergarten as the Goldilocks principle. Uh, not too much and not too little of any disturbance or sunlight tends to be the best for, in this case, forested wildlife. That's because sunlight is really driving the productivity of these ecosystems. And so here I've left that same gradient that we had on the last slide from low to high canopy cover at the top. And I just showed you a picture of kind of what that might look like. And then I've added our three sort of main food resources for wildlife, browse, soft mass, which are like fleshy fruits uh, and hard mass, acorns, walnuts, hickory nuts, uh, or American hazel. Uh, and they all tend to be most abundant in places where there's abundant sunlight. And so to provide lots of food and also lots of cover for wildlife, we often want to think about ways to get more sunlight to the forest floor. And so what I'm going to show you now is just a number of silvicultural practices. Silviculture just meaning, um, well, actually, the forester should tell us what the root word of silviculture is, the culture of trees, essentially. Um, a number of silvicultural practices and what positive impacts they can have for wildlife and wildlife habitat. Uh, this, the source for all these graphics, I just shamelessly stole these from my friends at Purdue University uh, from a really nice uh, article they have called Managing Your Woods for Whitetail Deer. And it's about much more than just whitetail deer. So I encourage you, that's in those supplemental resources that I shared at the beginning and I'll share again here at the end. Uh, and I encourage you to check that, that out for some more detail. But as Hank mentioned, clear cuts can sometimes be a really effective way to increase wildlife habitat. It can be an immediate introduction of early successional shrubby, dense vegetation that in a few years can be producing a lot of soft mass. And in a few more years can be really important for hard mass because it's going to uh, increase the ability for oaks, for example, to regenerate. So if you have a large property or you can work with your neighbors and justify uh, sort of a large scale harvest and creating a large patch of early successional vegetation, a clear cut's a possible option, though we tend to see on smaller properties that's a little bit of a blunt instrument. And we'll talk next about all the alternatives that you can use uh, to clear cutting. Uh, the, the downside to clear cutting is it does tend to introduce edges. And I mentioned that edges can be good for some species, but bad for others. Uh, and that can include having impacts that sort of ripple out into the forest. Uh, with things like predators, like uh, raccoons and possums, and also nest paras parasites, uh, namely brown-headed cowbirds. So sometimes we don't want to introduce edge, but in a large continuous area of a, a lot of forests, like we see in southern and central Illinois, clear-cutting can certainly be a good wildlife habitat management practice. The next sort of step down is a shelter wood, which is sort of uh, between no harvest and uh, a clear cut. And this is uh, choosing, and again, Hank mentioned this already. So leaving trees in the canopy, often leaving trees in the canopy that will produce high quality um, regenerating uh, tree seedlings like um, oaks, black cherries, sort of uh, walnuts, desirable species for the next generation. So we leave some canopy trees uh, out there, harvest around those canopy trees, and then eventually uh, after the forest has started to regenerate with the introduction of additional sunlight, uh, go back in and harvest those canopy trees that we left in the first round. Uh, this is another even aged management uh, practice, but uh, it introduces a lot of sunlight to the forest floor and can produce a lot of soft mass in the first few years and then eventually help regenerate the challenge of regenerating oak forests uh, and create a lot of uh, good wildlife habitat in the short term and in the long term. Uh, a sort of small scale version of a clear cut is group selection. So cutting uh, basically patches in the forest. This creates an uneven stage stand. So it creates sort of a mosaic of uh, more mature trees and then open areas of early successional vegetation. This is uh, sort of comparable to what happens naturally when large trees fall over in the forest and cre can create really important patches uh, of uh, 
where a lot of sunlight is hitting the ground and creating a lot of uh, forage and cover for wildlife species that like to seek that out in close proximity to mature forests. Single tree selection is another uh, silvicultural practice that uh, can re retain a mature stand but provide opportunities for more sunlight to hit the ground. Uh, you can take marketable trees out and then in its place allow for the regeneration of, uh, of oaks and hickories uh, or also the production of soft mass in those canopy gaps. And then finally, crop tree release is more of a timber stand improvement practice than a silvicultural one. But this is a, a case where you go in and you pick out uh, trees that are likely to produce a lot of mass if given the sunlight to do so. Uh, and then you harvest around them. And Hank had a really nice slide that sort of showed this from the other angle, from sort of uh, the side. Uh, and we know that crown area is really predictive of the amount of acorns that a tree can produce. So if you have an oak tree in your forest that is getting crowded out, creating more opportunity for sunlight to hit all around that tree can really increase its production of hard mass and be really good for uh, wildlife habitat. And then of course, all of these also provide nice open areas for bats to forage and other species to forage, aerial insectivores to forage. Okay, my last rule for helping healthy forests help wildlife is to protect, protect and enhance unique places in your forest. And what I wanna do is just sort of draw your attention to all the unique places in your forest that you may be able to help wildlife. Uh, I'm going to start first with edges, uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about edges because it's a real opportunity area, especially in northern Illinois and most of Iowa, where our forests tend to be relatively small and uh, abruptly transition from forest to agriculture or forest to developed land. We can get a lot for wildlife out of managing our edges. Here's a picture of a landscape in eastern Iowa that just sort of shows you the potential for edge management for wildlife. Here I've drawn, drawn in yellow every single edge of trees. So every place that the forest sort of abruptly transitions from forest to uh, some other sort of land cover. It's 132 linear miles of potential forest edge in this 22 square mile landscape. And in this area, we can uh, we know that there's often challenges for farmers along these edges where uh, crops tend to compete with moisture and sunlight uh, with the trees. And then we know that from this is a yield map from a study actually in Mississippi that shows all of the red farmers are losing money. And you can see they're often losing money along the edges of their woodlands. And so this is what a hard edge looks like, an abrupt transition from uh, mature forest into a crop field. That picture on the right is from Ohio, uh, where we were studying northern bobwhites. And that really abrupt transition from woods to field really doesn't do much for wildlife species that like early successional vegetation along the edges. And so what we can do is we can take that mature edge and put an early successional buffer between that edge and the crop field with a practice called edge feathering and create a lot of really good early successional habitat for wildlife along the margins and all of this sort of opportunity area, these transition areas. You can do that two ways. You can do that by planting out away from the extant forest edge into the crop field. You could go around with native grasses and get those established first and then fell trees into the transitional areas or just let birds plant uh, new shrubby vegetation to come in there. Or you can go into the forest from the field edge and create early successional habitat by felling canopy trees back into the forest. Two sort of equally advantageous ways to create uh, early successional habitat along the edges of your forest. Now I'm just gonna list a bunch of other areas that I want you to think about. Riparian areas are really important for wildlife. Uh, we see a lot of diversity of wildlife. And then of course, lots of aerial insectivores feed over these riparian areas. And we wanna just remember to sort of protect these areas uh, and manage them uh, to have disproportionate positive impacts on wildlife habitat in our forested environments. Uh, wet areas in the middle of forests are really important, especially for the reproduction of uh, amphibians. And so any wet areas in your forest deserve careful attention and think about them in uh, management plans and, and try to the extent possible to protect their integrity uh, so that amphibians can use them for reproduction. 
Uh, also, the prairie is a really important sort of nexus between uh, uh, between forests and prairie ecosystems can be really important for certain species. Like, for example, the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee forages in the prairie and overwinters in the forest. And so we want to think about those areas. And along major rivers, there's often places where bluffs, uh, fire would have historically maintained prairie ecosystems and forests. We call them bluff prairies, goat prairies, opening forest openings, things like that. I've got a picture of one uh, on a friend of mine's land here in central Iowa that he's done a lot of active management with fire uh, in clearing to try to promote wildlife habitat there. And then dead trees are really important components of wildlife habitat. And wildlife biologists always like to remind people that the life of a tree extends far beyond the days that it's blooming uh, and can provide really important roosts, um, overwintering sites for insects, uh, foraging locations, dinning locations, and everything else. So dead trees are a really important part of your forested ecosystem. So in summary, I just want to sort of wrap this up before we take some questions. Um, I want to encourage you to always be thinking about making careful observations in your forest, documenting them in some way, and using those to revise and, and uh, approach your forage, forest management practices on your land. Set realistic goals, species that you can have on your land, given the constraints of the neighborhood or where it is in the state, and then work towards those goals. Uh, as we mentioned and all of you shared, there's lots of ways to impact wildlife. Every single thing we do on the land will have winners and losers of wild in terms of wildlife and wildlife habitat. And so think about what you really want to achieve on your land and then start to work towards those goals. And then finally, anything that's good for the forest is, tends to be good for wildlife in the aggregate. Uh, so healthy, diverse forests help wildlife to do that combat invasive species, it's a huge challenge that we're going to be facing for years to come. Uh, and we just have to do the work and then manage succession uh, through the management of sunlight and uh, through space and time. So lots of additional information in that supplemental resource that I shared. I've got an article all about birds in Iowa, and it talks a lot about how to manage forests for birds as well. Uh, lots of really good resources on invasive species in Illinois. You're lucky to have that. Uh, and uh, here's one example of that. And I linked to a website with a bunch of examples of that. Really cool article from University of Illinois Extension about simple steps to manage forests for bats with this cool uh, figure that I talked about, though I never explicitly showed. And then Purdue just has a great series on uh, wildlife habitat management, including a template for a uh, wildlife habitat management plan that could really help you think about what your goals are and how you'll get to them. Uh, and with that, here is one last chance at that QR code and that link that I shared in the chat at the beginning of the presentation. And then I'm excited to take your questions.